YouTube kanalına hoş geldiniz. Ben Ayla Bozkurt Applebaum, Santa Barbara'dayım, Kaliforniya Üniversitesi'nde. Çerkezim, Çerkezce çalışmalarına burada Santa Barbara'dan devam ediyoruz. Bugün Kafed için Profesör John Coloroso ile konuşacağız. Welcome John. Um, I don't think you need any introduction to this community, but just briefly to say, um, you have been a professor of linguistics and uh, and in Canada and McMaster University. Uh, I was telling my daughter yesterday that I'm going to talk to you today for coffee. Her first question was, uh, being not circassian, how did he get started <laughs> with circassian studies in general, linguistics and uh, languages of Caucasus, and particularly uh, <laughs> Circassian. Uh, Circassian. Okay, Maybe so. you will start with that. Okay, let's start That's with that. From the beginning. All right, it's a bit complicated, but um, it's a sort of a funny, funny story. I think it shows you how important uh, chance and, and luck are in a person's life. That's so true. I owe it, I owe it all to Sputnik. Uh, which sounds crazy, but I was 12 years old when Sputnik was launched and the United States, which originally where I'm from, um, was in a state of panic. And so they started applying all these tests to call talent from the population to find the young people that they could, they could train in some way. Uh -huh. um, so I scored very, very high on a, on a test, an IQ test. And so instead of simply going to teacher's college where a lot of my high school friends were, were destined, um, they wanted me to apply to a big university. Oh, cool. And so I ended up getting a big, I was very poor, my family was very poor. And uh, so I ended up getting a large scholarship from um, engineering at Cornell University. Uh, and after two and a half years, my thesis supervisor uh, succeeded basically in taking my scholarship away and giving it to his nephew. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. True story. A guy named Hartman. Um, so anyway. anyway. This happened at Cornell? Yeah, I have it at Cornell, yeah. Okay. Uh, it was just in the 60s. So okay. yeah, the students had no rights or, or recourse at that time. Mm -hmm. So then um, I didn't know what to do. Uh, the School of Arts and Sciences uh, knew about me and gave me another scholarship instead of the other one. But I didn't know what to study. So I had taken some philosophy uh, and some Russian literature as electives. Uh -huh. So I decided to become a philosophy major, um, for better or worse. Well, it turned out that if you were in philosophy at Cornell, you had to learn ancient Greek. Mm -hmm. uh, so here I am doing ancient Greek. And my professor says to me, he says, you're flunking the course. <laughs> What's wrong? He said, you cannot translate between Greek and English. And I said, look, when I'm in Greek, I'm in Greek. When I'm in English, I'm in English. He said, uh-huh. So he handed me a book and he had a little paragraph in it. He said, read that paragraph. And so I read the paragraph. It was in Greek. And he said, you understood that paragraph? He said, I could tell from the way you read it. And I said, yeah, I understood. There's a few words I don't know, but basically I understood. Okay. And he says, you're a polyglot. <laughs> I said, what? You're a polyglot, he said. So it seems, well, as a child, my mother was Anglo-Saxon and German, uh, or French and German, actually. Um, and my father's side was Italian. And so I actually spoke Italian and translated between my grandmother and my mother. And I've forgotten all about that. And we now think that people who have this kind of background uh, often retain the ability to learn languages later in life, and which we call polyglot, which is Greek for many tongues. Mm -hmm. So um, I did ancient Greek, and then I, I tried to get an MA in philosophy, which I think was a waste of time. but. Uh, I went by every day, I went by an Armenian church, so I stopped in and they had classes in Armenian, so I did a little Armenian. Uh -huh. And then I went to Harvard and uh, there I studied Farsi and uh, also uh, Old Georgian. And I worked with an old man, uh, Alexander Zurayev, uh, who had been a friend of Leon Trotsky. Uh, I worked with uh -huh. him. 
on Ossetian, Digoran Ossetian, which is an Iranian language. And then um, I took a year off and, went, uh, and I went back. And uh, when I went back, this one professor, I went back to linguistics, this professor hands me a cassette. And he said, this is a language called Abaza. And my friend in England recorded it. And he says it only has two vowels. I think he's crazy. You listen to it and tell me what you think. <laughs> So I spent an entire month listening to this. So you had no introduction to uh, any yeah. Northwest Caucasian language then? No, that was a yeah. Fourth one. <laughs> it was an art saga. Uh, I can recite the first few lines even today, you know, like 40 years later. Um, and uh, I went back to him. I said, you know, it only has two vowels. It's, it's backwards, it's doing the opposite, the mirror image of what almost all languages do. Yeah. Uh, and so he accepted my, and I presented him a 110 page transcript of the story, um, phonetic transcript. And um, so uh, uh, I was encouraged to go to New Jersey to work with some people that had worked with a Dutchman named Eric Capers and also a Frenchman named Georges de Maizieux. Uh, people who had also worked on these languages. And um, also I, I got in touch with uh, Hans Fucht of Oslo, the late Hans Fucht. Yeah. And he sent me all these recordings of Ubuk. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I began to go back and forth from New Jersey. I'd already been there to work with uh, uh, Zaraya van Ossetian. And uh, so uh, I was doing Bjabo, which was a dialect that uh, the two men I knew Rashid Habso or Tahabso, okay. and uh, Isa Isa um, They were my teachers and they both spoke Jadol. And so I learned Jadol and at the same time I was going through the recordings of Ubuk. Mm -hmm. um, I was amazed. The language was just astounding. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was at Harvard, which meant that I actually had to learn a, a foreign language and I had to know something about it almost every language in the group to which that language belongs. So they really wanted people to have That's a good, um, language base. Yeah. Unlike MIT. And, uh, but unfortunately, it's because I had had a lot of logic from philosophy. When I started seeing what Chomsky was writing, I thought he was very naive and making fundamental mistakes in terminology and, and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and he was just down the road and word got out and they, so <laughs> it was a fight, uh, and so I couldn't do I couldn't do Chomsky yeah, syntax. There were some interest in from MIT, right, with the uh, uh, after Kuiper's uh, claim on to no oh, vowel. That's right, no vowels. I, I, Kuiper's. Yeah, so that yeah. was nineteen sixties. Kuiper's no vowel in um, <clears throat> Cassian or yeah. Cambardian. Cambardian. Yeah. Kabardian uh, vowelless language, morpheme and phoneme in Kabardian, and yeah. argued that it was a vowelless language. There, there was some interest from MIT and these yeah. languages. Morse so. highly attacked him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they were look, working from two different um, paradigms, and the typers was a structuralist, and Halley was a generativist. Yeah. Um, what, what the languages do, I mean, very quickly, I just give it. Uh -huh. Almost all languages say take English or Turkish too, we'll do this. If you have a front vowel, the consonant before it say, or the consonant after it, you, in English it's the one before the vowel, assimilates to the point of the front vowel. So it's hard to hear sometimes, but you can actually feel it much more easily. Mm -hmm. The K and K, 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 K is further forward in the mouth than the K and, and car, K, 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 yeah. K, like that. And we attribute that automatically, you know, perceptual processing, we attribute it to the uh, change to the vowel. We don't notice it in the consonant. Yeah. But the Circassian, Ubuch, Abkhazian, and Abaza, and, uh, what they all do is the opposite. They do the mirror image. They attribute the color of the vowel uh, to the consonant. Yeah. So they and do the mirror image. It comes from the degree of overlap. Where do you think that attribution comes from? Is it like a degree of overlap between the consonant and the color. Yeah, Articulatory overlap. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a question of how it's interpreted. So 99.99% right. of all languages interpret the vowel as coloring the consonant. Right. What in these languages, <clears throat> and it's driven by morphology, it's driven by the grammatical forms, mm -hmm. 
is that the vowels are colored by the consonant. Awesome. Now you have two vowels, one close and one open. And the thing is that you cannot make a consonant with an open mouth. So that vowel is stranded. That vowel never gets never gets gobbled up. That's left behind. And then there's sometimes a third vowel that results from, from other processes. And there are a few other languages on earth that do this. One is from a language family in Papua New Guinea uh, called Ndu, <laughs> N-D-U. Um, and uh, there was a grad student um, recently I ran into who I was doing his thesis, he was trying to extend my work, and said he had found 33 languages that did this. Um, and so particularly, constant colors the vowel as opposed to vowel coloring the consonant. Right. That's what's going on. Uh, and the result are these huge uh, consonantal systems. Uh, Ubuk had 81. Yeah. Jadoka uh, has, I think, 67, 68. Uh, Abkhaz sub dialect has 70 something, 72, 73. Uh, but they're in perfectly good sense. It's just the mirror image of what the, the average um, uh, language learner does. Um, the language is in one direction or the other direction, John. Well, it's it's. I mean, why do we why do Northwest Caucasian languages chose this direction versus the other direction? Well, for example, um, you have shu uh, for you plural. Uh, yeah. Uh, in in the um, and so if you wanted to put it into a verb, um, and you say something like um, uh -huh. you all saw you yeah, yeah. see you know some group of people or so, sakash um, you all saw me yeah like saw me um, so. The, it's no longer in front of a vowel, it's that the rounding is now, the rounding of that ooh, you hear shu, is, yeah. it's actually on the shu, the shi, shu, like that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's the ability of these pieces to carry the rounding or the, the high vowel, the palatalization, they call it, to carry it with it to another spot where there is no vowel. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, so um, uh, your heads, you know, something like that. It's this inalienable, inalienably possessed form. Not all Jiddle speakers have that. But um, I have a friend down the road now who speaks Jiddle, another professor. Wow. Yeah. Um, but his father in law, an older man my age, knows it much better than he does. Uh -huh. he, he speaks it. Um, uh, so th these are very interesting languages. I had to pick some language, and I started on that. And that's how I ended up, <laughs> the poor boy set out to study physics, um, ended up uh, working on Circassian. It's a long, funny story. Um, well, we're glad that you did. <laughs> I think it was meant to be in some way. It was meant to be. I think maybe the, um, the, the next natural question is, John, um, so we have Northwest Caucasian languages, mm -hmm. Yeah. In general languages of Caucasus, and then we have Northwest Caucasian languages. How do we know that these languages are related? And when do you think the uh, <laughs> separation has started? Nice, yeah. Uh, well, they have uh, very striking and complex grammars at uh, practically all levels. Uh, so they form all kinds of words out of smaller units. Um, they uh, have very complicated verbs that express a very rich range of, of meaning. Um, they have this, what we call vertical vowel system. Um, and uh, uh, when you see parallels like that, um, you think immediately that these languages must have these two, one of two things. They've either descended from a common source or that they've been in position for a long time and have uh, come to basically resemble each other by chance. That's called aerial influence. The area itself uh, has a style of speech. Um, and no one could re reconstruct. I mean, one of the things I did, Slava Chirikpa, my friend and colleague Slava Chirikpa, has a thesis uh, reconstructing the mother language and he has over a hundred consonants because the technique normally in comparing languages to prove that they're related is you know one consonant here, the other consonant there, and they have to be the same match up all the way. Okay. Um, and I said, no, I said, there's too much complexity. Uh, even 
uh, even in Jadok, you have pairs like Hara to, to turn around versus uh, I think it's Fara, turn around Fara. Uh, so there's a rounding and things happen and whatnot. Uh, and I said, what's happening is that some of the coloring and the vowels and all, it's the, it's the vowels that are changing. There was variation in the uh, words. So W plus the word or Y plus the word or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to reconstruct the mother language and it only had something like like 45, 50 consonants. It looked normal, looked like a normal language. Uh -huh. And this attracted attention. And I gave a talk and I said, how to reconstruct Proto Northwest Caucasian or how to crack a very hard nut because no one had been able to do it. And I was in the audience at Chicago and a very famous Indo-Europeanist who just died uh, back this past uh, uh, February. Uh, February of, nine, uh, of uh, 19, uh, Eric Hamp. He literally physically pulled me out of the conference and set me down in a courtyard in a very chilly April day um, and said, why don't you compare this language to Indo-European? Because I think that you have reconstructed something that looks like a, a, a relative of Indo-European. Uh -huh. And I said, okay, I'll look. And eventually what I did is I came up after two years, I found about 50 some odd forms that I said were original forms that had descended down into the various branches of this family. Mm -hmm. and I called it, I call it Proto-Northwest Caucasian. And I said, this family is actually distantly related to Proto-Indo-European, which is the big, big family from which English comes and you know, Scandinavian languages and Slavic languages and Languages of India, Iran, Ossetian, Iranian language comes from it, uh, Italic, Greek, uh, Armenian, a huge, huge language family, very important in history. And I said, th these languages uh, were part of the original and they were left behind. Uh, the others expanded out uh, across the Europe. Asian languages were part of the Proto Indo European. They, they were, I called it Pontic. Uh, oh. Because the Proto Indo European and Proto Northwest Caucasian were sisters. Okay, so they were. Uh, grandma, grandma was Pontic. Okay, okay, so I think that the Northwest Caucasian languages go back farther than the late uh, Dr. Catford claimed at 4,000 years. I think they must go back closer to five or 6,000 years. Uh -huh. And I found that we were working with Adrian Mayer on Greek vases that in fact there were some of these so-called nonsense inscriptions that could only be understood or could be understood fairly clearly mm -hmm. as archaic forms of Circassian or uh, also Georgian was in there and one, one or two words looked like they were perhaps Ossetian um, or something like uh, like uh, what Ossetian may have come from um, <laughs> and that um, uh, one had recognizable uh, Circassian forms, uh, one Ubik form, some Abkhaz forms, as long ago as 2,500 years. Mm -hmm. And if you already have the recognizable distinction that far back, 4,000 years only gives you 1,500 years to, to make that differentiation. It's too too shallow a time depth. So you have to go back farther. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I think linguistically, I think linguistically, um, uh, this is material that is now attracting attention. There was a whole volume of a journal, a Journal of Indo-European Studies recently that took up this issue of the relationship. Um, and um, I think that what happened was that these very elaborate fancy languages moved up into the steps um, from the Maikop culture, uh -huh. which was probably proto-Circassian speaking. Uh, and what happened was that they blended in with other people and the other people could not handle <laughs> this complicated rich language. And so it underwent a series of simplifications and produced what we think of as Proto-Indo-European. Mm. So, so what do you think is the connection? So does this come to connection with the Hati? Yes, the Hati, you know, this is where Slava Chiripa's work is important. Uh, he had an appendix to his thesis, and I thought really in some ways it should have been the thesis itself, was comparing Hattic with um, with Abkhaz, because Slava is a um, Zub speaker of Abkhaz. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I thought it was it was plausible work. There was also uh, Jan Brun, uh, Jan Brown, rather a Polish scholar. Mm -hmm. uh, um, when I was in my cop at a conference, we were in the same uh, uh, dacha room. We shared a, bit, a room, and uh, he floated all these forms, these haddock forms, past me. And I said, "Yeah, no, that that sounds like the Northwest Caucasian. It sounds closest to Abkhaz." Um, so the Hatti is where the the Hitti comes from for Hittite, <laughs> although the Hittites didn't call themselves that. They called themselves Nestle, like the candy bar, <laughs> Nestle candy bar. Uh, so, uh, but we know them from the Bible where they were called Hittites, and uh, that's the name that stuck. So it's a bit, bit tricky. Hittite is Indo-European, very archaic, and um, uh, causes a lot of problems for, for the Indo-Europeanist. Um, mm -hmm. It's distinct from Hattic, which is preserved as a religious language in a few Hittite documents. But what little we have of Hattic, I think, strongly suggests that the Northwest Caucasian family was all the way down into Anatolia, Eastern Turkey, Northeastern Turkey, originally. Interesting, isn't it? So, uh, but it is just, it's hard to find documents about Hattik. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are only a few, maybe text available or um, some hundreds, so maybe some words available in yeah. religious uh, ceremonies and such. So yeah. it, it's hard to make the connection strongly, but as you said, it is it is possible. It's possible. Sometimes all you need is one word to yeah. identify the, the, the roots of a language. There's a language uh, called the Gurian that was spoken in Northwest uh, Italy uh, mm -hmm. prior to the rise of Rome. It quickly disappeared. Um, but we know a couple of words. One of them, one of them is the word for a uh, mountain, it's Bergiema. Mm -hmm. uh, Berg is mountain, Berg, uh -huh. uh, and Burro in English. Um, and Giema is the uh, same word as Hima in Himalaya. Um, yeah. It means snowy mountain. So we can tell right off the bat, <laughs> the Gurian was of some funny branch of Indo-European and never got really yeah. uh, prominent and disappeared early. So that's all you need sometimes. Is if you're lucky, you get the right word, you can tell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's but of course, the languages now is changing so rapidly. This is mm -hmm. happening to our languages. And um, clearly, alphabet is changing. Is, uh, neighbors are changing, who we are interacted with, social changes. Everything is just like has huge impact on the, on the language itself. Mm -hmm. And um, how do you see that for the uh, Circassian uh, languages? Well, I think um, Circassians uh, in the diaspora are genuinely endangered uh, uh, of being assimilated um, uh, and uh, of losing the language in the process. Usually the language loss is um, language forms I say language forms the defining glue of a community. Uh, it doesn't mean the community has to be exclusive. The community can fit in with other communities. Um, modern society is layered like that. Um, but uh, we, we saw it with, uh, say, some of the Western Celtic languages like Gaelic and Cornish. Um, and um, uh, Cornish went extinct. Uh, they have revived it for whatever purpose, um, but they are in danger of, of, of losing their languages or of having them radically simplified in some way. Wow. Uh, the the case of Kabardian, for example, strong, even though the name comes from an ancient name from the Khazar Empire of the Kabars, um, Kapata uh, in Judo Kabarda in um, Kabardia, um, these, uh, this language looks as though it's Circassian that came from somewhere else where they spent some time in a community uh, where Circassian ended up being simplified. Uh, and in fact, some of the people I know who are Kabardians claim that they are descended from the Egyptian Mamluks, uh, the Circassian Mamluks, um, and if that's true, uh, it would account for the simple uh, simplification. 
I uh, have three children. My, one of them was a, a young a little girl, it was a little girl, she's grown now. Um, and when she was little, I would take her around the yard and I said, Kruh-yip, which is for look at the tree, or point to a tree. And she goes, go, <laughs> yip. She would give me the Kabardian. <laughs> it's funny. Um, so I, I think that retaining the language is, is difficult because one wants to get along with life, one wants to have a career, one wants to succeed in whatever society they're in. Um, I think the, the trick is to recognize the importance um, of, of the language for artistic purposes, that it has beauty and that uh, you can sing songs in it, you can tell stories in it, um, and um, that this means uh, that the language in itself is an important uh, feature of the culture that should be retained in some way. Uh -huh. um, I am in an anthropology department. I have occasionally worked with indigenous people here. Um, and one of the groups down in Maritimes, the Micmac, um, in an effort to preserve the language, they designate a young person every generation who's to learn the language and to learn all the myths and all the, the yeah. religious songs. And then that person is to pass it on to another. Uh, and similar with the Iroquois down the road and Mohawk and all down the road here. Uh, this is one way to do it, although the community as a whole won't use the language, they won't define themselves by the language. In my own case of the Italians, called Russo, <laughs> Red Nicholas was the <laughs> um, Red Nick, uh, Red Cola, uh, Nicolao. Um, I spoke as a child, uh, I forgot it, I went off to university um, at Harvard, I went to tour Boston a little bit, look around, went through an Italian neighborhood, I heard two men cursing each other in an argument, and I went through my head, <laughs> and I said, oh, oh yes, I forgot, I know Italian, <laughs> or whatever this bizarre dialect was, <laughs> it was very strange. Um, but what happened to my generation, uh, my cousin and my, my cousins, um, they all married outside of the Italian community. And uh -huh. so, uh, the, that, the generation from them, they don't speak Italian at all. It's dead. That's what happens. Yeah. No, yeah, that's what happened. I think that's, that's very, very common. Mm, very common pattern. Very common pattern. Um, and this ties in with the issue also that perhaps we should discuss briefly of the alphabet um, as, as well, because you and I both were at that conference, was in 14, was it? Or, or 13 or 14 April, right? About the alphabet. And uh, I mean, it's not hard. I mean, I, I made up a, it's a little tricky verb, because you end up with some symbols, like four symbols in a row for things like sh. Yeah. Oh. And so on. Um, but um, I was able to devise an alphabet for a Circassian literally in half an hour, um, in the Latin based alphabet. The problem is that while that may make, make it look easier for people who want to learn it, um, standardization is a problem. And it also means that if you adopt that alphabet, you immediately break your ties with the homeland or homelands uh, where there are, are uh, Cyrillic based um, alphabets and already dictionaries and collections of stories and, and so on. Um, so there's a, a serious cost um, in, in devising a Latin based script. As again, I say, it's not hard. I mean, if someone wants to see one, I'll do it. But um, uh, it's, it, 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 it entails social and historical rupture uh, with the homelands. And uh, the Russians, you know, they're, they're frightened of you, <laughs> frankly. Um, uh, but I think that they, they do tolerate a certain, I don't know, Putin's done things of their schooling, but they do have this established industry of printing. And they just reissued Hadagata's uh, collection of Nartsov as well, seven volumes. Uh -huh. uh, and um, so it, it, there is still at least a token effort to maintain the culture and language back in the homeland. 
Um, I mean, things changing there as well, like this mm -hmm. recent uh, uh, the policy on languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So things are changing radically in the homeland as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you think, how will that affect the homeland? Well, it's already met with some resistance. Uh, and I've seen some of the, <clears throat> the um, spontaneous responses against Putin's policy about uh, you know, Putin's policy is that the, the local languages do not have to be taught in school. Um, which is designed to r r make everything Russian, so to speak. Um, and in some ways, the United States is like that. In other words, everyone's got to speak English if you want to do any business, you know, and have a career. You go home and talk whatever language you want. Um, so to some extent, that's the Russian Russian attitude. They're, they're mimicking the United States in that regard. Um, and the result is language loss. Um, and so going to be more rapid, I think. Uh, it could accelerate it. Uh, although, you know, I was in Nuremberg uh, last year, and uh, there were about 200 or so Circassians in attendance, and I heard all kinds of dialects. Um, I heard more Circassian in two days than I had in the previous 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, was there countries countries or from homeland? There were people from the homeland and uh, people from Turkey, mostly from Turkey. Uh -huh. So I, I think the diaspora in Turkey still has some vigorous uh, linguistic life, uh, life in it. And I think the important thing is to remember that um, there's something very beautiful and, and unusual about these languages. These, this is not like just having a dialect of French go extinct or some funny form of German going extinct, although that's sad uh, too, like low German, for example. A lot of the Germans in Canada are, uh, speak a low German, um, and that's pretty well extinct in Germany, um, just in the last 50 years, 40, 50 years. That's sad, but it's not. it wouldn't be like the loss of these languages. Um, so it's just a quick, quick puzzle, a quick example. In the verb, you can express not only subject and object, uh, in the verb, you can express whether it concerns you. You can put a qa on the verb. Uh, ex uh, you can put uh, with something. You can put against the interest of something or for the interest of something. You can locate it in space. You can say it's over there. <laughs> it's over there. Well, you can put in eight or nine bits of information in a bundle that, according to linguistic theory, is a conceptual unit in some way. So a word is like, like a piece of meaning, a piece of, of an idea, and you string them together to make a bigger idea, a sentence. Uh -huh. so all words are supposed to have, all languages are supposed to have words. Uh, but when you look at the Circassian verb, you think, what in the world is going on here? How do these people conceptualize this? And there was a fellow at the Nuremberg thing. He was giving, he had a very good, he was from Saudi Arabia. He had a very good, uh, um, I guess it was Chen Bui, um, and um, he was reading it off, and there was the text on the screen, so I could follow it, sort of. And he goes roaring through these verbs, I had eight or nine parts, no problem at all. It's just blip, 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 next one, blip, <laughs> like that. Yeah. And so I asked some young people, and they were, I was impressed there were younger people there, too, that also were fluent. I said, when you hear these verbs, does all this information go through your head, like in a split second? And the guy went, hmm thought about it he said yeah it does <laughs> yeah. and I thought perhaps you could answer the same question um, yeah. and, and that is psychologically phenomenal um, and one of the people I, I have some contact with here is a, a, a woman in a university uh, <clears throat> University of California <laughs> no not yours but um, uh, San Diego um, uh, Marianne Mithun, who's apparently half Sioux Indian, something like that. And some of the first, some of the languages in North America do this too, similarly. Um, yeah. And so she was very interested in how in the world this works, how you learn a language like that. Um, and if, if they die, we'll never know. And it seems to, it seems to be a, a testimony to the simple speed of, of the uh, human mind. Some languages exploit and others don't. Um, 
I'm not saying people are stupid if they speak a language that's slow versus one that's fast. Or not. That goes back to work that actually I, I did back in the 80s and 83. I had a complete theory of language evolution. I couldn't get it published because Chomsky kept saying, and he still says even today, language has no evolution, which is simply nonsense. Um, it's easy to show how it did evolve. But um, uh, we, uh, we also need for efficiency, for speed, we need all those consonants. We have to, it goes in hand in hand with all of those huge consonantal inventories. So you can throw all these sounds in, they can all be contrasting and they can all work out. Boom, you got it. You know? uh, yeah, so um, it would be a major loss to psycholinguistics, uh, the study of the psychology of language and how it's actually processed. If these languages weren't extinct without being adequately adequately uh, documented, even then documentation. I mean, everyone says, well, Ubik's extinct, but at least it was documented. Georges de Maizière, Hans Fogg, you know, they worked on it. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's true, but it's not extinct. Language like Ubik, it is relatively well documented. Right, right. But it is, you said, mm -hmm. if you look from the psycholinguistics point of view, mm -hmm. then there is so much work to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't know. And and what we had so far was like we had a structure of the language. Okay, we ask the word, we tell us the word, and we compare that word with the other word. Right. But now the technology is changing so much, and mm -hmm. how we're going to study languages, how we're going to study psycholinguistics, probably is mm -hmm. going to change so much. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. going to be the same. So we know much more about how mind works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, the, the weird thing, um, I, I helped establish a linguistics program at McMaster um, back in 81, I think it was. Um, I, although I, I had a helper, we, two of us did it. And he says 81, I think it was 79, but anyway, a long time ago. And we uh, uh, eventually got a graduate program that was largely neuro-linguistics. Uh -huh. But the trouble is that the technology for monitoring mental activity, brain activity, um, is fairly costly. It's located in hospitals. And the demand for it is for, for, from people who have brain tumors or head injuries, whatever. So the, the pressure on um, the machine is, to, uh, is for clinical use. And it's very hard to get any time uh, for just someone to put their head in and, and count from one to ten in Circassian or something. Uh, it has been done for Mandarin Chinese, a woman who spoke Mandarin Chinese and English. And the neurologist looking at it said that the head lit, her head lit up entirely differently for the two counts, which is sort of like um, a refutation of Chomsky, Chomsky's claim. <laughs> but, uh, refut refutation of Chomsky's claim that, that uh, these differences are superficial and that they're all being processed in the same uh, speech area or an abstract organ uh, in the brain. Um, it, it's weird, but uh, I mean, if I were a young person now setting out and wanted to do some interesting psycholinguistic work, I think I would, or, or linguistic work, I would say, okay, pick up one of these languages, uh -huh. uh, enough to, to reasonably work with some fluent speakers, and uh, try to get enough money to do brain scans and actually see what's going on. We try to come up with psych, become basically a psycholinguist testing, um, not just Circassian, say, or Uba, or Uba, no, Circassian, but um, testing the limits of, of human uh, speech processing, the speed at which it can be done, and how, what exactly psychologically, neurologically, a word represents, because, let me, put it, let me put it in someone else's words. I, I had the opportunity back in the 80s to visit Sir Harold Bailey when he was way up in his 90s, a, a very famous polyglot at Cambridge. And he had a, his own little house on campus and it was jammed with dictionaries. And he said he, he could master every language he decided to look at except for Circassian. And wow. he was never able to, <laughs> to work with Circassian, master Circassian because it didn't have words. <laughs> Okay. Words. And I asked, I asked my, my, my teacher, Rashid Habsu, 
uh, talk also about that. And he said, take care of the little pieces and the little pieces will take care of themselves. So the little pieces will make a word. And it's as though, it's as though you're playing a piano and you've got two hands. One is doing the sentence and the sentence and the other hand is doing the word you know, here. The other hand is doing the words. Um, it's as though the language is going in parallel in two levels. Um, and the verb is carrying uh, all the information the sentence has, perhaps even more. And then there's also the sentence. And this in itself is it's just, it's just very strange. Uh, so this is a, a, these, this whole family is a remarkable set of, set of uh, languages. There are two other families in the Caucasus, it's Northeast, of course, um, and there's always trying to compare these. I, I don't think they're related. Um, I think what similarities we see are, in fact, aerial, uh, just from being near each other. Uh, and then there's Georgian. And if you look at some of the, the place names, um, Georgian, seen, the original language for Georgia seems to be the related language called Swan or Swan, and that um, Georgian seems to have been somewhere else and pushed up into the Caucasus, just as Armenian has been pushed up into the Caucasus. Um, the Caucasus is, is a haven, it's a safety place for people who are persecuted and driven from their historical homelands. Um, so it's important uh, historically for that purpose, and then it takes us over to the mythology and all that. But um, I think that the loss of these languages would be a great loss uh, for uh, uh, for the study of the mind, not just for linguistics. Yeah, I think it's, 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 uh, about uh, how fast information is being processed. Mm -hmm. In like Circassian, so comparing languages, mm -hmm. if you speak like morphologically this richer for language mm -hmm. versus morphologically less rich languages, like I mean English has quite a bit morphology, but not you know less less compared to English. Is there there a factor in Circassian? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of derivational morphology, a lot of which is derived from French, uh, from Latin through French. Um, um, I see, I mean, the other language that's often dragged into this whole picture is Basque. Uh -huh. and, um, I have a friend who, who's a linguist and uh, who is a Basque speaker. Um, it clearly is a relic from some earlier period in Western Europe when before Indo-European pushed in. Um, and I think when you're, it only has something like 25 consonants or so, and when you're comparing 25 to 80, <laughs> it's easy to find things that look alike, um, yeah. but it's one of these funny, funny things where it's just not clear that it's 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 um, that it's, you really can't show that it's related. I don't think uh, oh, there's some work I can do. Casting, you don't think it's related? No, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there was hurry in the northern Syria. Uh, people say, "Oh, that's a Caucasian language." You look at it, it doesn't even look Caucasian. It looks like you know, uh -huh. knows where it came from. Um, they were clearly intruders into the area. They're culturally very important. Um, some kind of weird, weird language. Um, there's a young man trying to compare Georgian with uh, Borushevsky, uh, a language isolated in northern Pakistan. Uh -huh. you know, I sort of thought it was promising. Another expert thought it was a waste of time. Um, these sorts of things. Um, but we now have other tools that are important. We have rich archaeological uh, studies now, much more sophisticated than just say 20 years ago, and we have genetics. And um, the the interesting thing is that for the link between uh, Northwest Caucasian and Indo-European, the archaeology matches up quite well and the genetics matches up quite well. Uh, Can you give some examples of the archaeology and the genetics matching quite well? Well, spoke wheels. Wheel, it's not, hollow wheel, a wheel with a rim and spokes, mm -hmm. spokes a solid disc. So if you look at ancient Sumeria and uh, Akkadia, you know, 5,000 years ago, ancient Middle East, they have uh, an ass, uh, a horse-like animal pulling a, a cart that has big, heavy, clunky wheels. Uh -huh. What the Indo-European, what the Mycop culture had and the Indo-Europeans had were ch chariots, wagons with spoke wheels, much faster, much more maneuverable. Uh, and they had the horse. 
uh, and they succeeded in domesticating the horse. Um, uh, so that's the archaeological uh, parallel. Uh, the, the genetic one's interesting. Um, I was at a conference at Radcliffe in uh, 2010, I believe, um, and genetics was just emerging. And Nick Patterson from the Broad Institute at MIT Harvard came over to me at lunch and he said, someone said I should talk to you. I said, what? He said, we have this gene that we find only in North India where they speak Indo-European and it pops up elsewhere. It's on the Y chromosome, something to do with men. Uh, and uh, it pops up elsewhere across Eurasia, precisely where Indo-European was spoken or is spoken. He said, but the place on earth where it has the highest incident it's right here on this map, he said, of people called the Dige. I never heard of these people, oh. the Dige. Who are these, the Dige? <laughs> so, said, well, you knew them well. <laughs> I said, these are Circassians. Uh -huh. Oh, I have heard of Lawrence of Arabia, Peter O'Toole, Circassians, you know, uh, which is about as far as it gets. Um, although Boris Johnson had a Circassian grandmother. Um, uh, yeah. Um, the... Um, I said to him, I said, we should collaborate. Uh, so I'll do linguistics, you do genetics, and we'll have convergent research that comes to the same conclusion. And he got excited. And about three months later, he emailed me and said, well, I talked to an Indo-Europeanist, and I, I found out your ideas are not uh, canonical. He was being polite. That was a crackpot. They said, I don't think I want to work with you. <laughs> so, uh, two years ago, February, two years ago, a friend, in, uh, I collaborated with a man down at Linguistown in Arizona named Tom Markey, and he had a genetics friend, and he said, I have a message for Carl Russo. And I said, okay, what's up? And he said, well, the geneticist says Carl Russo has been vindicated, and he's lived long enough to see it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so he was referring to the link, the genetic link between my cop culture and um, the European. Uh, the European. Now, there's a little cup that was dug up out of the Mycop Kurgan, uh, and it shows a stream, and it shows, I think, a, a, a stag and a bear and whatnot. There's some little animals on it. It's a famous artifact. It's in the, the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. And one of the things on it is uh, linked closely to the river is a thing that looks like a fish with legs. Uh -huh. uh, uh, short little little uh, cloven feet, and I looked at it and I thought, whoever made this cup spoke Circassian, because what she or he has carved on the cup is a cup, um, a sea pig, cup, yeah, oh, yeah. A, a sea pig. Oh, okay. Cup, he, ha, 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 pig, ha. And he's never seen one, but he's trying to make something <laughs> look like a pig and also like a fish. <laughs> oh, in between. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I thought, you know, uh, this one little figurine alone proves that whoever carved this was speaking Circassian mm -hmm. uh, or something like that. Did you say that they found that uh, figure? It's from the Mycop Corgan. Okay. Uh, Grave Mound, uh, which was excavated, I think, in the 19th century. Uh, late 19th century by Russian scholars. Um, it doesn't exist anymore. So it was outside my cop. Uh, and uh, what else came? I mean, I don't, I don't remember anything about the, the rest of the horde except for that one, one little thing and the spoked wheels, um, horses. Um, what is the dating with these, John? Is it like 6,000 years? Ten thousand years? What? How I think, far? Uh, I think um, three thousand five hundred, three uh, four thousand, something like that. Uh, BCE, so five or six thousand years ago. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't remember that too well. Uh, I didn't, do, I didn't become an archaeologist for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> that will be. Yeah. Else. Okay, so um, I think they have sent us some questions. I will look at uh, uh, what else do they want us. To... Oh, there's one interesting question. Um, when did you become interested in the mythology? And uh, 
the Nart sagas. And can you tell us a little bit about the Nart sagas? Yeah, okay. And how you put them in the, uh, the world mythologies. Where do you put them? All right. Um, when I was at Harvard, I had access to speakers down in New Jersey. I should add to that uh, the late Majda Hilmi, uh, All right. who, who spoke both Kabardian and Jadol. Uh, her mother was a Kabardai, so her father was a Jadol. Um, and she helped me uh, uh, later with Kabardai, um, Kabardian. So um, when I came, when I graduated in 75, the academic market had collapsed. Uh, I was only able to get a job in Vienna, and um, my wife at that time was Jewish, and World War II had been in vain as far as the Viennese were concerned. Plus, she was unhappy there, so she was a Sanskritist, and she got a job offer from this university in Canada, McMaster. Uh -huh. We came here, but you no, know, there, there were no Circassians. There was no Circassian man that, that gave me um, a Circassian. Um, his Cherkaska. And um, so um, there, there was a need for me to somehow try to keep the languages up and going. And uh, I had received from Rashid um, the collection of, of Hadrat, as Nart, um, uh, Nart uh, volumes. Uh -huh. And uh, so I managed to get a grant from the National Endowment of the Humanities, the NI, uh, NIH, which existed back then. And it was administered by a group in Philadelphia. And I was uh, uh, a peripheral scholar in a sense. So they were able to keep it on US territory, but I was uh, the one conducting the research. And I started translating. So, uh, Rashid gave you this as a, like in Russian? In what language? In Circassian. In Circassian. Yeah. It was written in Circassian? Yeah, oh yeah. Um, was a, a, a amazing scholar. He did an enormous amount of work. He has seven volumes of Nart Nart, or Nart tales, yeah. all in the various Circassian dialects. Um, so and it dwarfs anything else. I mean, there's one volume of Abaza. There's a couple of volumes of Abkhazian. Um, there's Dumazil's Ubuk stuff. Um, and there's, there really is only one art saga in Dumasio's collection. Um, so uh, I had this huge uh, collection and uh, I, I was working with Rashid and, and Issa and um, uh, they were selecting what they thought were interesting stories and so forth. Anyway, in the course of that, I ended up being divorced. Um, and, but then I ended up uh, with another uh, lovely lady, Linda. And one day, Linda uh, was looking through a file drawer in my office at home, and um, uh, she saw all these folders with this weird writing on them. And she said, what's all that? And I said, well, that's just a bunch of stories in Circassian that I've, I've had translated. I've translated them, some of them myself, and so forth. And um, I probably did about two thirds of the work. Uh, all that. Then I uh, rendered their efforts into uh, uh, smooth English. I learned Circassian from, from doing this. I said, uh, it was my effort to keep the languages up and going. And she said, what kind of stories? And I said, well, the heroic tales uh, of ancient, ancient tales. And she said, what are they doing in the file drawer? She said, publish it. <laughs> I thought, mm-hmm. No, okay, I'll try it. Okay, so uh, I, I the dominant publisher in mythology is Penguin. Uh, uh -huh. um, they have the book of Dede Korkut um, in, in Penguin or so, or a selection of the book of Dede Korkut. Uh -huh. um, and so I sent it off to Penguin, and to my amazement, they rejected it. And I thought, huh, that's weird. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the other big publisher of mythology, the Bollinger series, is Princeton University Press. So I sent it down to Princeton University Press, and they agreed to publish it. Um, and in fact, they were so impressed by the footnotes and so forth, although there's some mistakes in the footnotes, um, 
I wouldn't say those things, some of those things now, but uh, they were um, so impressed that the editors said, I shouldn't tell you this, but they, they said, this is a work of enduring importance of which we should be very proud. Um, and they also wanted the Ossetian collection uh, as well. Um, and so this is a very prestigious academic publisher, 90% rejection rate of manuscripts. One in 10 gets through the, gets through the gate. And I got through twice. Uh, so, um, well done, yeah. that, that's, that's how I ended up doing that. And the other factor driving it too, was that um, in 83, uh -huh. um, I tried to have published my theory of language evolution. Uh -huh. After hearing Chomsky visit my university here and talk and talk about how language had no, no evolution. Because I, when I was also in physics, I was also very much interested in paleontology. So I knew a great deal about evolution and dinosaurs and prehistoric mammals and prehistoric humans and so forth. Um, and I knew that, that something like this did not arise um, spontaneously. Uh, fully formed. And you can even see it in a child. You can see a child recapitulating probably the evolution of language uh, as they learn. Um, and it's a nonlinear system. So all of a sudden, like, like the virus, like the coronavirus, all of a sudden it explodes. Um, and so all of a sudden you, you get probably had full form modern languages from something more like children's language. That sort of thing. But I couldn't get it published. And I decided it was a, a, a career crisis. And I decided that I was wasting my time trying to contribute to theoretical linguistics, although I had already done some. And now, you know, 40 years later, I find my work is being cited. Um, and I decided to start working on, on myths, uh -huh. and, um, comparing myths, because I was very good at sort of looking at pieces and pulling them all together. Um, <laughs> And it turned out that the Nart sagas had parallels with all kinds of interesting um, traditions far uh -huh. in the Caucasus, you know, like the Irish myth and um, Russian myth, is, which was just close, um, but still very distinct. Um, but still, there are, are these parallels. Uh, what do you attribute to those parallels and were those similarities? I mean, is it just the nature of the myth itself, or is it, do you think? There are more reasons that these are so parallel or they're, they're so... I think, I think there are two reasons. One is I think that there's some very ancient shared material from when the Indo-Europeans or Aryans... See, I, I've argued that Ar 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 the original word was Ar and became Ar in Indo-European. became Adir in Circassian because the R became a D and it became Ara Ar Ar in Abaza or Ar Ar in Abkhaz which simply means tribe, means people. So uh, the Tuzum people. Um, uh, and then of course, the still is retained as an ethnic designation. That's one, of the, that's one of the shared, or what we call cognate words between Northwest Caucasian and Indo-European. Um, so there was some material uh, that was very ancient and probably common to both. And one of those would have been the, the battle of the storm god with the storm serpent. Uh -huh. Very rich. And in the Nart sagas, it's Sosroko fighting Tortoresh. Um, and there was even one by, um, um, I can't remember the scholars, it's, it's on uh, uh, YouTube. Uh, it's Tortoresh actually fighting the serpent. So something even older. Um, and um, the other other source is so perhaps somewhat later, so probably originating with Indo-European that has been brought into the Caucasus uh, because of contact. Uh -huh. uh, and then there's some actual local uh, Caucasian material like the giant chain to the mountaintop in the Caucasus, no less, that's crept into Greek. Um, that sort of thing, sort of two-way street. So good stories go go all different directions <laughs> at once. <laughs> I think people in general we love stories, and mm -hmm. there's a reason that it shouldn't go around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, stories are another reason to keep the language alive, um, and uh, 
let's let's say that the, the scholars, uh, I mean, had Reifler was very good. I mean, there, there was some very good a bit of um, uh, with the grammars, uh, his grammars uh, dictionary. Uh, they're very good scholarly work, but there's a limited number of people, and we can only do so much. And the Russians, uh, I'm told now by a Russian that because of my grammar, they now feel they have an access, they have a, a, some way of actually beginning to grasp and deal with Circassian language, which before they just found absolutely impenetrable. Um, and I was, uh, I was told I should feel very proud. <laughs> and anyway, I hope it works. But anyway, um, the, the, um, it, it's so much easier if you actually have somebody that can speak the language and, and I spent years trying to learn the language relative to do the art sagas. Uh, I probably couldn't order a cup of coffee in Circassian, but I could read an art sagas. <laughs> um, uh, and um, the help from Rashid, from Majda, Rashid, and Isa was invaluable. Um, but it was to, to go through the kind of translation they had made, which hardly at times made any sense. Uh, it was difficult. I had to go back to the original Circassian and try to flip to the dictionary and the grammars and see what were they trying to say in English that it was being said so easily in Circassian. It uh, is true. And there are so many words that it is just so hard to translate it to English. Yes. It's, it's, uh, you know, but nevertheless, it has to be translated if it's going to be in English. Well, one, one thing Isa said that Isa Tarkhofa said that I never forgot was he said, you can't you can't translate into this into English, some verb. You can't do it in English. He said, but if you experience this in English, you would say this. <laughs> yeah. 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 Which I thought was probably some kind of absolute ultimate peak in difficulty in translation. Um, and of course, there's translation theory, which is a branch of linguistics. And uh, I did give a lecture recently in a class on that as a favor to the instructor. But um, I don't. I don't uh, work on translation theory as such. Um, but the, the languages, the speed, the compactness of the languages is, is just, it's just extraordinary. Um, and like any normal, I've been called a hyper polyglot by, by one person who interviewed me, <laughs> whatever. But um, not using it, 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 it goes dormant. It's, it's biologically almost impossible for it not to. Um, and I was on my second day listening at the conference in Nuremberg, and there was an argument, and one man said, up, which means it, it, it won't happen. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I know this language too. You know? And then it began to resonate in my head without any... Uh, control or any you know, yeah. information. Effort, yeah. Yeah, before that, it was just, I was so upset because I worked so hard so many years on it and hadn't done anything with it for maybe 10 years. And then, well, since we were in Istanbul, and um, <clears throat> then it did come back <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> so it takes some time. <laughs> um, so I think there are a couple more questions. I think we covered most of the questions that they want to ask. Um, let me just, um, um, I think back to Nart Sagas, there are some similarities between Nart Sagas and Greek mythology. And uh, I think you did, uh, would you like to address that a little bit more? Like, uh, Well, I think, um, it's tied into this paper um, with Adrian Mayer about a translation of nonsense inscriptions. Um, there is a inscription or a vase uh, called the goose vase, goose being the bird. Um, and there's a man who's about to, who's tied up. He's about to be uh, whipped by a man wearing Scythian clothing, and the Greeks hired Scythians. Um, you had trousers and, and jackets, like modern clothes, as opposed to the Greek togas. Um, the, uh, the Scythians, a variety of people, as long as they had this costume, right? and he's about to whip the guy, 
and there's a woman sitting off to the side or an old person with a dead goose on their lap. Uh -huh. The man says, I, t I stole the goose, um, <laughs> something like that. And the woman says, you're going to be punished. And that's in Greek, and they can read that. Right? And then the man says, no ra re te bo. And that's written out. Uh -huh. and, no ra re te bo. You've got two R's in a row. That's, those are Y's kicking around inside the verb. Okay, no is far away. And the, the O part is still preserved in bzibab has a piece on the verb if the speaker is astonished at the action depicted by the verb. Oh, um, so uh, <laughs> um, the orders, uh, that piece is now lost in Circassian, but the order's there. And uh, I thought uh, it meant something like he snuck around over to an enclosed, a flat open area and stole this. Uh, can you believe it? Way over there somewhere, can you believe this? And so the policeman is justifying his punishment, speaking in ancient Circassian. And he's wearing clothing that Circassians must have worn back then because they had close contacts with the steps. Okay. And so um, the, the idea here is that uh, the Greeks traded uh, with the Circassians all the time. And Colchis, 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 which was their name for the East Coast, uh -huh. it's word. It's the Circassian, Kuchhe, Kuchhe now, um, or Kuchhe. Um, uh, Shhe uh, has sounds like head, but Kuchhe oh. means mountain region, hilly region. And um, originally it was Kuchhe and not Shhe. Kuchhe. And that came in the Greek as Kochis, Kochis, or something like that. Um, and I know that because the word for mountain in Ubik is Shhe. And so I know that the sh that you get now in Sargassian for for um, head or top or whatever, originally oh. was sh um, with a sh. So yeah, it's the Ubik helped on that one. Um, and I think they had very close ties. Um, uh -huh. That there was a lot of, of uh, exchange uh, culturally, probably genetically, uh, people marrying one another, and so on and so forth. Um, and in some ways, if you look at accounts of Circassian culture uh, prior to the uh, um, ethnic cleansing of the 19th century, uh, it does sound sort of like Sparta or something. It has a kind of uh, a kind of quality to it. The Greeks did not treat their women well, but the Spartans did, and the Spartans treated them very well. And of course, they're extremely warlike. And the Circassians, the same way, extremely warlike, treat the women very well. Yeah. So I think there must have been some kind of cultural ties between the Spartans or Dorians. The Spartans were Dorian Greeks, the Spartans and the uh, <coughs> Circassians. <coughs> and I think that some of this myth came in in the myth, the one eyed um, Cyclops, uh -huh. uh, the, the Yenish. The Inij is one eyed in uh, Circassian art circus. Um, the uh, uh, giant atop of a mountain. Um, the late George Shalashidze did a whole book on that. Um, and that seems to be inherently a Caucasian theme. Um, so there, there were, I think, close cultural ties. I think, in a way, that the Circassians. Uh, have a remarkable adaptive ability. They can fit into a culture very easily. Um, yes. And I, think, I think, yes, I think now, to some extent, this is working against them because it's greasing the wheels of assimilation. Um, and I think that what, um, that there are so many questions in uh, myth mythological studies, so many questions about ancient antiquity, uh, so many questions about um, even medieval Italy and whatnot. There are a whole bunch of, of questions that scholars can't answer because the Circassians are invisible to the eyes of most scholars. Uh, so for example, Slava Shrikba, again, he's got a very interesting paper talking about the mother of Leonardo da Vinci. Uh -huh. Apparently was a Circassian slave, Maria. Um, really? Yeah, mm -hmm. he makes a very good case for that. Um, 
And of course, there was the wife of Ivan the Terrible. She was also Circassian. Uh, yeah. Amazons. Who are the Amazons? That's a Circassian word, the forest mother. Um, where, where is this some kind of Circassian institution, or Kazi and Circassian institution of, of women warriors that would fight at times or whatever? Um, and uh, I mean, whether it's medieval Italy, uh, history of Russia, or um, um, uh, ancient Greece, uh, there's a lot of stuff just dangling. If you if you go to uh, even to to ancient India, um, and go to the ancient most uh, most ancient books recorded, the the Vedas, the Rig Vedas, and Veda is the same word as English, wit, meaning knowledge. In this case. Uh, and Rig means argent in Latin, means silver, shining, shining knowledge, Rig Veda. There's a great war, be war between the storm god, the battle between the storm god and the storm serpent. The storm god is Indra, which is actually an uh, Abkhazian name, Yinra, the big one, okay? Yeah. And Vertra, the strangler, uh, Vrr is worry in English. Um, worry to death. <laughs> um, there's a really strangle, not, not psychological. Um, and there's some funny lines in there. No one can make any sense out of this. Vedic scholars have debated these for generations. Something like Indra feigned friendship with the darkness and Indra stood up. Those are lines from the Rig Veda. And what you, what you get when you get the account of Sushruko and Totraj, Totraj is a darkness. Sushruko feigns to be, be friendly with him to try to you know, ask for a reprieve in battle. Um, and then the, the business about standing up is another hero, Patras. He's washed down from the mountain, goes into a grave mound, is resurrected. Uh -huh. and he stands up to get the, to get the great sword from the pillar, central pillar of the grave mound. The great sword uh, in the central pillar of Valhalla was stuck there by the Norse god Odin. I mean, it ties into that. Uh, it, tie, it ties into the whole theme of resurrection. Uh, Patras goes out. Um, he's sent to um, fight uh, Shimarokwa. Nara is, is in the European route for death or murder. Um, so he defeats the, the Prince of Death and he comes back like Jesus, unrecognizable from the tomb. Mm -hmm. When Jesus was resurrected, they couldn't recognize him. And when um, Pateras comes back to the Nart feast, he's unrecognizable. He looks like a corpse. He has bad hair and bad skin. Sage, I think, a tree. Something like that, say and tree, um, shitty hair and shitty skin, <laughs> something like that, bad hair, bad skin. Um, and um, so, I mean, there's all this stuff, all of a sudden it makes perfect sense. And you can complete accounts uh, of these little lines that actually fit into whole stories now. Uh, and you get these in the narrative sagas. And so I think the reason that we, these were longstanding puzzles in scholarship uh, had to do with the, the, the fact that Russia, uh, Soviet Union, particularly made this place invisible to the West. Uh -huh. Kept under, under block. And inside the Ottoman Empire, inside Turkey, no one was getting uh, in contact, they even knew about these problems and issues. So I think that there's an enormous amount that can be helped and resolved and, and advanced once Western scholars start looking at this material seriously. Um, I hope I live long enough to be vindicated on that one too. I'll be 75 in a few weeks. So, we'll so I think having circassians more visible in the world scenario, it's just mm -hmm. on the world stage, will be more helpful to yes. in many respects. Yes, it is. A, it is a, a people looking for a nation. I mean, it's the Kurds are in a similar position, but they are they have they have their territory, but the territory is all split up. That's the problem. Uh, Circassians have their territories divided up, um, but there there is great reluctance, uh, fear on the part of Moscow and the Kremlin that if they were brought back and repatriated, there would be problems, local problems with people who are already there, or the, the um, mountain Turks in Karachai and Balkar. Um, but you know, there was some repatriation from the Balkans in the Balkan Wars because there were Circassian villages there, and they got, in, got along quite fine. I think one, another great feature of the Circassians is that they are loyal people. Uh, and given whatever country they're in, they'll be loyal to that country and defend it with their lives, really. They, they use their martial heritage for that. And I think one of the best and simplest examples or models 
for repatriation of the Circassians is that, uh, are the Chechens. Um, yeah. When I was an advisor to the Clinton administration, I worked fairly closely with the Kremlin. At one point, I said to my contact, who was an excellent, excellent man to deal with, um, Alek Serov, Oleg Serov, um, I said, you know, I said, right now, the national interests of the, of the Chechen people and the national interests of Russia coincide. Uh, you need a solid border that is stable and loyal. And that's what the Chechens have provided in their small chunk of the Caucasus. Mm -hmm. If they brought the Circassians back and allowed them to unify and accommodate the Karachai and Mabaza and Cossacks, and uh, Circassians are tolerant people, I think they would accommodate them easily enough. Um, they too would they be able to stabilize uh, their portion of the Caucasus. So between Northwest Caucasus, Ossetia and um, uh, Chechnya, Ingushetia has to be accommodated somehow too. There's stress right there now. Mm -hmm. I think Russia could have a stable uh, southern border, which is one of their great concerns. Um, because Russian borders are rarely natural. They're always having trouble. They're obsessed with security because their borders are not natural. Um, so I, I actually broached this with one of the leaders in Nuremberg. And he said, I said, no one in Russia is interested in this. No one, no one wants to face up to the problem. They don't want to deal with it. Uh -huh. It's too bad. I mean, you know, I got the Chechen thing to work. I'm, I'll take credit for it. I did it. I also got the ceasefire to work by playing a trick <laughs> so, <laughs> that the Russians adopted. Um, <laughs> but there are people who were not happy with the tricks. So I'm not going to go into that. But, um, but you uh, think there's a possibility that these three uh, Circassian regions, at least the uh, Adigay Republic, Kabardin Balkar, and Karachay Cherkes, to, uh, to actually unify? I think that would be a precursor to it. I think basically that they should, they should simply create a, 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 something resembling the original territory, take it, taking it right out to the Black Sea. Uh -huh. um, they already have a stalwart supporter in Abkhazia, whether they're happy doing that or not. Mm -hmm. Abkhazians are happy or not. Um, so they have the southern flank right there on the Black Sea coast already secured basically. Uh, thanks to the stupidity of the United States State Department on that one. Um, and um, I think that uh, uh, doing something similar, Shepsuvia, whatever uh, you want to throw in. Um, yeah. And I think that they, they would be able to stabilize their southern border. Uh, the Romans did it. I mean, the, the Romans basically created it, Abkhazia, Georgia, and Armenia uh, to act as buffers uh, with the, uh, against the Sasanians. Um, uh, so, uh, Byzantines, I say, Byzantine Romans. Um, and so it's, it's a timeline or technique to secure borders that is to create vassal states, uh, that, uh, basically secure it for you. Uh, and the Chechens worked out pretty well. Now, the problem is Dagestan has got lots of, of local grief going on and it has to it'd be very difficult to solve that one. But um, at least uh, the Chechen issue is now stabilized, more or less. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm not endorsing uh, um, the, the leader. I think he's, he does some pretty nasty things sometimes. But nevertheless, he has provided, um, what's his name? Um, uh, I recently saw it in the news too. I'm giving my head. Uh, Kadyrov, Kadyrov. Yeah. Karyarov. Um, but, you know, he has, he has stabilized the situation. Uh, and that uh, nation is in danger of being... It's, uh, being recognized in the no. West. Hmm? Is what it is about Abhazia is being recognized in the West? <sighs> well, they refuse to recognize Abhazia to oblige Georgia. In my position in the State Department, which, where I was giving advice, was that by insisting that Abkhazia was part of Georgia, they were simply keeping Georgia vulnerable to Russian interference. Oh. That not doing Georgia any any um, favor whatsoever. In fact, they were doing it a great disfavor. Uh, and that the best thing they could do was to tell the Georgians to let it go and recognize it and, and we'll stabilize it. Um, and they didn't. So now 
there's like this China Taiwan thing or something, that Georgia Abkhazia, um, and that kind of stuff you know, go on for generations and, and just be an irritant, local irritant, um, and it helps polarize Russia's position as opposed to the position of the West. And um, one of my problems was that I was never, I never treated the Russians as enemies. I always treated them as a people that had a very different history uh, from what the average European nation had. And so uh, because of their history, they were absolutely obsessed with territory and control and security. Um, and curiously enough, this got me sometimes in trouble with the anti-Russian industry that exists in Washington, with people whose careers, uh, and some of them are my friends and I respect them a lot, but their careers are based on seeing Russian interests as absolutely, utterly inimical uh, to anything with um, uh, with the United States in particular. Canada is not quite so bad. Canada, in some ways, uh, finds it can work with Russia a little more readily. Perhaps, perhaps uh, I've become Canadian in that regard. Uh, uh, but I do think that the Kremlin is making a mistake. That the one thing I'm involved in, I haven't done my job. I'm involved in an effort to revive Ubuch that's headed by two scholars. And I was going to do the, the Volk's solicitation. I can actually I pronounce the crazy language. And, and I was going to um, uh, make a elicitation list that could be posted somewhere on YouTube. Uh, and and it's, it's clear because it, it blunts the claims of genocide. Look, we, you know, maybe our ancestors did very, very bad to your ancestors, but we're trying to help now. We're going to try to bring this language back, you know, kind of thing. So politically or culturally, it's sort of a, a big deal uh, and it's sort of a smart move on the Kremlin's part. Uh, but on the other hand, it's only a minor step in a much bigger journey. Um, and uh, with any luck, I'll be able to do the elicitation list sometime this summer. But um, uh, it's been a difficult and bizarre uh, three months. <laughs> for the entire planet Earth. Um, but I, I do think that the circassian problem is solvable. I think there is a solution for it. I don't think it's it's hopeless. Uh, on the other hand, it's a voluntary issue. If you want to stay and be a, a thriving Turkish businessman, that's good. If you want to be a thriving Lebanese businessman, that's good. Israeli, whatever. Uh, Syria, better get out. Huh? Um, but uh, also in Germany, they fit in quite well. Uh, I would say in the U.S., they're doing quite well too. Um, so um, strength and our weakness, in a in a sense. Yeah, behind me, you see a little medal or right my finger right there yeah. that yeah. was given to me by <laughs> by Circassians. Um, and I took it. I received it at uh, um, the mosque in New Jersey, which is I don't know if you've been there uh, to to Patterson. Um, but they 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 have a nice coherent community, small uh, but coherent. But of course, in time, these these issues will become simply matters of, of her heritage of my tradition, and mm -hmm. I assume that they'll blend in and assimilate, uh, just as every other immigrant group has done pretty well in the United States. Um, you too. It's natural. It's natural. It's nothing to do uniquely peculiar or evil about the United States or Canada or anything else. You embed yourself in a community where your livelihood uh, is 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 at stake, and you have to become part of that community. That's true, mm -hmm. uh, John. I think um, um, there there are a couple of questions that I just got it on the sidebar. Mm -hmm. uh, one question is: um, Oh, can we uh, can we uh, re-invite you to this YouTube channel and um, perhaps uh, give you a chance to, and give the audiences a chance to ask the questions and maybe answer those questions? Because when people watch this, they may have questions and they may just send us questions. Mm -hmm. And um, and one more, one last question I'd like to ask you is: What do you suggest to young people now, young Circassian people? What do you uh, do? You have any advice for them? I have met some, particularly in California, recently, uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, uh, at a uh, reading of Nartsagas. Mm -hmm. Curious, you know, 
I think that you should be proud of your heritage because you were a brave and naturally democratic group. You may have had princes and nobles and so forth, but the people's voices were readily heard by, by the rulers uh, and taken into account. Uh, so you were both brave and democratic. And I think that you uh, should learn as much about your heritage as you possibly can and do as much as you possibly can to help now uh, if you if you so wish i think you uh, have a choice i don't think you have to do that but i think if you want to you should feel encouraged to do it i must say that when i began this many years ago there were just a handful of people wanting to do some of the languages um, and now i get emails from economists from political scientists from anthropologists. You know, there are many more people that are interested in the Circassians, Abkhazians, um, and Ubuk as well. And I think that um, the future uh, is, is more promising now. I think that it is one that looks in some ways more normal. The only thing that's missing is a stable, coherent homeland. Um, and I do think that the Chechens offer an example of how that can be done too. Um, the question is, what what are the fears uh, that circulate in the Kremlin when this topic comes up? Um, and uh, it is, I think, a testimony to the valor and bravery and military power of your ancestors that to this day the Russians are still a bit worried about Circassians. When I first met um, my contact at a restaurant in Washington, he was very frightened and worried. And he said, you look like you're Circassian. Uh -huh. This is an Italian mountain face from Campobas, <laughs> uh, or Fusalon up in the hills of Bari. Um, and uh, I said, surely you must have read background on me. I'm not Circassian. And he was worried about even sitting down at the table with me because he thought he was going to have to sit and talk to a Circassian. So I think there's a great deal of animosity. I think there's a great deal of moral polarization between the two sides. And I think that this kind of, of uh, reaction uh, is an impediment. I think it's understandable. It's in some ways justifiable, but I don't think it's helpful. Um, and I think uh, future uh, interchanges I have to sort of set some of the blood and gore and suffering aside uh, for the sake of sake of the future. Um, and I do think that um, uh, as a nation, you will survive. I assumed when I started in looking at your languages back in the late 60s, that you'd be extinct probably by the 90s. Mm, it didn't happen. I don't think it's going to happen. No. Right? The internet, the, internet's going to it. I think the internet's going to prevent it. And I think COVID-19 is going to tell us that we don't have to be in the same room, uh, that we can do a lot uh, of stuff by technology like this. Like uh, this, yeah. So I am optimistic, but I think do what you find interesting. If you want to work on your people and your heritage, do that too. Um, it's something that needs to be done. And... Um, do it well and be be proud of your heritage. I think every reason to be to be so. Great, thank you. With that happy note, John, I'd like to thank you a lot on behalf of the Caucasus Federation, CAFED, and myself, and uh, spending your Sunday afternoon with us. We yes. have learned a lot, and uh, this is this is so great to see you again. Yes, thank I was good to see you. Again. Thank you for your help, Ayla. And yes, if there's some session where you want me to answer questions, we can set that up too. Perfect. Um, Thank you so much, John. Okay. So, okay. bye. So, bye. I'm off. <laughs>